Hello, everyone. Welcome and namaste to today's ECDF and CEDRIC's special Global Online Parenting Summit, a mindful parenting in a chaotic world. I'm Ms. Amrit Nakpal, and I'm the head of preschool and ECCD at Birla Open Minds. And today I'm going to be the MC for today's session. So let's begin. But before we begin, I would like to invite Dr. Vasavi Acharya, the chairperson of ECDF, CEDRIC, and DNA Acharya Foundation. Over to you, Dr. Vasavi. Thank you, Amrit. And welcome back to day two of the ECDF Online Parenting Summit. After yesterday's brilliant sessions, today we have another wonderful lineup of speakers who would be joining us from India and from all over the globe and speaking on very relevant topics related to effective parenting. So uh, why wait? Let's start off and over to you, Amrit. Thank you, Dr. Vasavi. We've had a wonderful day one. So let's move on with day two. And I'm sure all of you all are very excited to hear from most of our speakers. Okay. So before we begin, I would just like to tell everybody that I am really showing off really. a five minute okay. left placard when five minutes are left for you to speak. So please be mindful. And then when you're only two minutes left, I'm going to be opening up my mic and saying there are only two minutes left. So we'll request all of you all to proceed towards winding up your session. Uh, please be mindful because we have a number of speakers lined up and special time slots given to everybody. So we would like to start on time. Our first keynote speaker for this evening is Mr. Karthik Sarda. He is the director and the CEO of Sathi Global Education Network. He has published sci-fi novel, The Unconventional Winner, Spectra Rice, in August 2018. He is going to be talking on the topic of building bridges, bridging the gap between parents and children early on. Over to you, Mr. Sar Karthik. Thank you, Ms. Amrit, um, for this opportunity, and uh, thank you, ECDF, as well. Um, special thanks to Ms. Smriti Agrawal, as well, for inviting me to speak here today in front of this amazing audience. Uh, so I guess I'll just begin, uh, you know, with the topic. So um, when I read the title of the topic, Bridging the Gap Between Parents and Children Early On, two thoughts came to my mind. One was that this is all about communication, right? Something that is not just parents or children, but even the most successful executives in the world have troubles uh, in mastering this. The other was that I have no experience raising a child. I'm not a parent, but that might be a good thing overall because that makes me unbiased in my presentation today. So I'm sure that almost all the people present here today have an amazing experience working with children so I won't be talking about the how or the what in parenting. That I'm sure that all of you here are more qualified to address than me. Instead, I want to take this opportunity and address the why behind a few things that research says we need to address as a society. I will try to take a scientific stand to parent-child communication and hopefully bring out some valuable points for all of us to consider when it comes to bridging the gap early on. There are three primary areas that I will be considering today, the parental bias towards their child, the pressure of expectations on the child and the social and academic development of a child. So starting with the first one, all parents love their children unconditionally, no doubt, right? Uh, I have often heard young parents say that their entire life decisions after having a child were based considering their kid in mind. There is no denial that this bond between a parent and a child is the purest there is, but it also comes with a small element of bias that should be addressed consciously. Parents have certain expectations from their children, you know, uh, without any doubt. And coming from a tutoring background, I know this firsthand that parents almost always exaggerate their children's abilities. This bias is good in keeping the child motivated and in fact should be used for that effect. However, it should also be noted that it sets unrealistic expectations sometimes 
and puts unnecessary pressure on the child's growth. It is important to understand that every child is unique in their own way of learning capabilities and, it sh and should be treated as such. In a research conducted by University of Michigan's Medical Center, it was found that, and I quote, parents consistently overestimate their children's self-control, ability to persevere and stay on task, consistency of performance and social ability. So in short, there is a bias amongst parents when it comes to their child's psychological abilities. This sometimes results in a parent being too harsh or hard on their child unintentionally. We know that a six-year-old is going to throw tantrums if they don't get what they want, or a 10-year-old might skip the math homework for video games, right? But to better understand parental biases, we should consciously stop comparisons and work towards strategically incentivizing the kids for inculcating good habits. And that's where the communication actually becomes most important. Alan Kasdan uh, explained this problem really well in an article. He says, when a child doesn't perform according to expectations, the parent's stress level rises. Changes occur in the parent's behavior, which become setting, uh, which become setting events for deviant behavior by the child. When you bear down harder, in other words, you increase the likelihood that your child will escape and avoid authority, which will inspire you to bear down even harder, and so on. So the spiral of escalation twists up and up, sometimes to the point that a parent loses it and ends up doing something normally unthinkable, such as slapping small children, for instance, for failing to nap when they're supposed to, right? So when, what are a few specific things that can be toned down to bridge the gap of communication? Well, starting with something that is very relevant to our Indian culture, stop expecting perfect grades from your students. Most basic one. Also stop expecting immediate changes in your child's behavior after a punishment or a rebuke. Accept their abilities as well as inabilities equally. Lead by example. The best way of communication is by showing your child what you want them to do rather than telling them what to do. This is also a good transition into talking about why incentives work much better than punishments. I think that this is actually applicable not just for parents, but also for all educators uh, present here. There have been numerous studies done for more than 100 years that prove that incentives work far better than punishments. I think uh, Pavlo's dog is probably the best example of how strong incentives can be in motivating a certain kind of behavior. So if you want to communicate with your child better, and if you want them to understand you, then you also need to understand them. Instead of saying, you will be grounded if you don't clean your room, try saying, you will get an extra hour of watching TV if you clean your room, right? And these kind of communication tactics might actually improve the bridges that are being built during this early child development. And communication always happens from both ends. And we all need to understand that we are always going to be more mature than our children. Thus, it is our responsibility to lead the way when it comes to bridging the gap Involve your children when they talk to you about butterflies or Spider-Man, for example. Make them feel like you're treating them as equals rather than treating them as children. Try to educate them without the additional pressure of comparison with their peers. Tell them about their own strengths and weaknesses rather than exaggerating them out of proportion and putting your child under pressure. At the end of the day, it is the basic idea of communication that applies everywhere from parenting to corporate world listen to the different point of views that are brought up and the gap will automatically be bridged. So that's all I had uh, on this topic. Hope you all uh, found it useful and thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Karthik. There were some wonderful takeaways for our audience. And yes, uh, I completely agree with you when you say that show your child what to do rather than just telling them what to do. I think that works very well for parents. Yeah. So if parents out there, I think that's a very useful tip that you should be taking along with you. Thank you so much, Mr. Karthik. Thank we you. move on to our uh, next keynote speaker. Our next keynote speaker is uh, Ms. Deepa Bhushan. She's the director of CP Goenka Group of Schools. She's also a recipient of a national award for excellence from from uh, for her outstanding achievement in the field of education and Ms. Deepa is going to be talking on a very relevant talk 
topic today that is about managing your child's anxiety. So relevant in today's uh, time when we are under a pandemic. Over to you, Ms. Deepa. Thank you, Amrit. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank ECDF and Smriti for having me on this platform. Uh, really nice. I, I think I'm going to take a lot forward from what Karthik has already said. He has given a lot of strategies uh, that can be taken forward. And I'm going to take these ahead uh, in a slightly different manner. So uh, can I share a PPT? I have a PPT. So do I have share screen rights? Yes. Oh, thank you. Is it visible to all? Yes, it is. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about today is managing anxiety in children. I'm sure uh, in today's time, all parents, because uh, they're also 24 seven with their children at home, are seeing a lot of anxiety, you know, whether it is um, a lot of technology that causes the anxiety or whether a little bit of separation also, because now parents have started going back to work and children are at home. And if they see that, you know, the parents are not around, what happens to them? Meeting new people, fear of the dark, fear of the unknown, there is so much of anxiety for young children that is there. And how do we help them to overcome this anxiety or to really manage? I'd say it's all about managing your anxiety as adults too. We have a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, but it's all about how you manage it, the tips that you have, uh, take, and how do you ensure you're able to lead a better life? Yeah? So I'm just going to take you through a few tips uh, in today's session. So the first thing is you as a parent have to find out what makes your child anxious and see what is it. You know, sometimes it's a change in routine, unfamiliar people, unfamiliar spaces. I know of a lot of children right now who have, uh, you know, been at home for the last two years. The preschoolers haven't seen any members outside their close family circle. So when they are moving out or when they're going out somewhere and they see a lot of people, they're getting extremely anxious. They start crying, clinging. All those elements are coming through and that's happening with a lot of young children. We have a lot of parents telling us about this. So we have to start recognizing first, what is it that makes the child anxious? And if a child is slightly like say, you know, by the time they come to nursery, junior KG, senior KG, grade one, two, they're able to articulate to some extent and they can recognize what is it. So when I'm crying, what am I feeling? If my hand, are my hands sweaty? Is my heart beating fast? What's happening? So, or they need to recognize their anxious feelings also. For very young children, it may not be possible, but for the slightly elder kids, they are able to articulate and also recognize when they are feeling anxious. And that's the first step towards managing anxiety. The second thing is that, you know, I always tell uh, parents of young children, uh, more than the children, first you need to look after yourself and look at yourself. Yeah. And why is that? I'm going to explain something about mirror neurons to you. Young, you know, we say young children are monkeys. They actually replicate everything that adults do. And that, but that's also why they learn so fast. They learn communication, uh, they learn habits, they learn everything. So children have mirror neurons, which means they're picking up everything, the mirroring, and they're picking up everything that an adult who is their caretaker is doing. And it's so important. So when we're looking at anxiety, the first thing is for us to look at ourselves. Because we, we find it very difficult, you know, uh, when a child is upset, a child is crying, we also get very hassled. We aren't the ones who are going to stay calm, smile through it. It's okay, let the child cry. You're, you'll see your reaction, your body tightening up. You'll see things happening to you. And, it, and the child is picking up, picking these up. Even the clues, uh, you know, things that you may not say, the child is picking up and is realizing your body language too. So extremely important to realize it. So the first step is to look at oneself and take that 90 second pause to understand, not to react, but to respond to a child's anxiety. And I think that's the first thing that a parent needs to do. So 
I, and this image, and I'm not going to go into depth because we have a short span of time, but this image very clearly states the difference between a reaction and a response. So the first thing that a parent needs to do is look at oneself. And when a child is anxious or you see a manifestation of the anxiety, you need to know that you need to differentiate between the reaction and the response. Yes, because it takes the child, if you react, it takes the child child's anxiety to the next level. And that's not something that you would like to do. So for yourself, take a deep breath, resist the urge to act impulsively, name how you feel, put your ego aside and think about the consequences, a must. Yeah. So as role models, we have to show them the way. When you feel nervous, explain what you do to calm down. Show your child that even you have worried feelings, but you are able to manage them calmly. Yeah? And also take pride in the fact that you're able to manage them. The child is seeing all these elements within your space. Connect with them. When your child is feeling anxious, logic barely works. Instead, let them know you understand you know, how they're feeling, what's going on within them. This actually helps them calm. Sometimes just giving them a hug and saying, just patting them actually helps them. Also actually, you know, giving a name to the anxiety. What is it that worries them? Okay, and I will not let, uh, children uh, actually learn maximum through stories. I know that there have been certain uh, spaces where yesterday they've spoken about that. So giving a name, making it a character and saying, this needs to go away and this is not going to trouble me, helps children that worry helps children to go away. So there are these uh, amazing activities online called worry puffs. And you can look at them and utilize them to actually help your babies if they are uh, uh, undergoing anxiety. Of course, using relaxation and calming strategies, taking deep breaths, reading a favorite book, closing your eyes for a few moments, all these elements, physical activity. So even if you're jumping, your dancing actually helps you to manage your uh, anxiety. I won't go into the science of it, but there's actually a science to managing anxiety through physical activity. Using visual techniques, we all know color calms. There are various colors that calm us, certain pictures that calm us, showing them to children, books that are there. You know, and also uh, if you see a stressful situation coming up again and again and again, it's so good to sometimes role play that situation and give the child a strategy that the child can use whenever that situation comes up. And if you're not around or the child is unable to manage it, so the child knows what to do at that time. Breathing, I think this is the best superpower for everybody. And I think we need to teach it to children at a very, very young age. And don't avoid if you all notice that your child is af always afraid. Normally what we do is we keep away the stressors. You know, don't do that. Instead, you've got a lot of tools now. Use those tools to help your child to manage the anxiety and the stress. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to encapsulate it simply for a parent. Recognize what is the stressor, what is going to reduce that anxiety. Reflect yourself because your child is young and may not be able to do so, but you're giving them the tools to reflect, reframe, and always, always respond. And of course, you may not be able to prevent a storm. Stressful situations are always going to be there, but you can always make sure it doesn't ruin your day through mindfulness, self-care, and little joys. Teach your children this. I just want to say, uh, I would just want to close with one last thing, which is, uh, I'm sure everyone knows about Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, so one of the most awesome things, and I'm actually going to read this out about Eeyore, is that even though he's basically clinically depressed, he still gets invited to participate in adventures with all his friends. They never expect him to pretend to feel happy, and they never leave him behind or ask him to change. They just show him love. And I think this is something all parents need to do when managing anxiety and managing your children. I think this will help the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Deepa. And I think you've just summed up the session so beautifully by saying that, you know, we just need to show them love, whether we are a parent or an educator or just a caregiver. All children need is 
for us to show us some love and some understanding. Thank you so much to be a part of the summit. Thank Let's you. move on further. We move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ms. Priti Agarwal, and she is an award-winning early childhood educator. She's also the project lead at Vibgyor Group of Schools, and she is going to be talking on destructive parenting styles and prevention. Over to you, Smriti. Thank you so much, Amrit. Uh, you doing a great job by taking this forward in such an enthusiastic manner. I would want to share my screen. So just one sec. In the meantime, destructive parenting styles, I don't know, but there are- We're unable to hear you, Smriti. We are unable to hear you, Smriti. Your voice is not, uh, could you be a little loud? Is it better now? Yes, much better. Okay, yeah. So destructive parenting style, I'm not sure, but I'm very sure that there are lots of parenting styles these days. And I was amazed when I was actually researching for my session today. I hope you can all see my screen. Yeah, you can, can you see my screen? Yes, it's visible. If you could just full screen, would be great. Ah, yeah, sure. Okay, good to go. So, this has been my mantra since the very beginning, since the time I began teaching in 1995 that I've always been a little upset about, uh, you know, we punishing children for being human. Of course, they have emotions and they have their bad days, just like we do. But we have these human qualities and we want our children to understand that we have grumpy mood. We had a bad day at office. Why don't you understand? Go away. Sit down there. Don't trouble mama. Don't trouble papa. But how often do we understand their grumpy moods, bad days or attitudes? Yeah. So this is something that we begin with. And you will have to actually understand at the end of the session whether which kind of parenting style do you belong to and whether it is destructive or it is not. I am nobody to tell you that these are destructive parenting style like my topic says. So here. And I have only graphics for you. Huh? Sorry, no uh, research, no uh, long papers, no text, only graphics for my parents to see and realize what, who they are. So are you the tiger? That means are you the tiger parent, the tiger mom and the tiger dad? The tiger mom and the tiger dad wants everything the best for their children and they want the, their, their children to succeed. And success is academic success, the percentage, how well do you do in an exam, in school, in uh, life. Smriti, I'd uh, like Smriti to could you hear a little louder, please? I'd like to hear yeah, you. Because... We can't hear you. Oh. So yes, we can't hear you very well. Yeah. Let me take out these headphones. Okay, is it better now? Much better. Much better. All Pretty right. much audible. So maybe that uh, earphone was not helping. All right. So, so I was thinking, I just tiger parent, the tiger mom and the tiger dad who want academic success for their children. Those who want their children to success, uh, succeed in everything that they undertake. And the percentage counts for you. Uh, like the three idiots parent, you know, if you do photography, percentage kitni aayi thi, you know, it fell down 2%. Even 2% falling down is like, oh my God, what to do? The hell break, all hell breaks loose. So, and is this how your child feels around you? Are you hovering over your little baby like this? Why don't you study? Why don't you do this? This is a time to do this. No, this is not the time to watch TV. How many times do I tell you? Is this the parenting style that you have adopted? So are you the tiger parent? And your child feels overwhelmed around you because you're always expecting something from them. That expectations are too high. And the success has is the main motto. And I think somewhere down the line, you feel that it is for their children's own good, because of course, as a parent, you love them the best. But is it? Is it for their own good? Just ask yourself. I have a lot of parenting styles for you. The next one. We all know this. Now, there was a movie also made on this. Uh, so helicopter parenting. So are you the helicopter parent? Are you the one who would decide what your child would eat, where? Who are they going to be friends with? 
what are they going to say, not say, go, not go, what are they going to do for the entire day? And are you hovering over them like a helicopter, seeing what are they doing? Are they doing it correctly? Are you, do you agree with it? You don't. So everything, are you so involved in their lives that they do not have space? They do not even get an inch or a, what they desire to do or say, eat, dress. In fact, I know of parents who also tell their children whom to be friends with. So they go to the school to pick up their children or to drop their children and they say, who was that you were talking to? No, 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 don't talk to that. Talk to this guy, you know? So it's like I decide the friends also for my child. So think about it. If you do that tomorrow, would your child be able to decide anything for themselves? Would they be able to take any kind of decisions in life? Or are you going to do that even when they grow up, even when they get married, even after they get married, they do the job? Do you, are you going to go to the office? Today you're going to the school to pick them up and drop them. Are you going to go to the office with them? Are you going to decide for them? How do they talk to their boss? Whom do they become? Which colleagues to talk to? What to eat? You're going to do that? Your child is going to feel very, very anxious when, they, when the child is left alone to fend for himself or herself later on in life. So just imagine, what are you doing? This is called the lawnmower parent. Now, this is a category which is really, really was coming up. And uh, it was somebody who would not want the child to face any difficulty in life. So I will mow the lawn for you. I'll make things perfect for you so that you don't face any difficulty in life because I love you so much. How can I allow you to face any difficulty when I am around? So you go and do everything for them. So even if in a game they are playing and they're losing or, you know, something, you try to set it right. When you are playing a game with them, you purposely lose so that the child feels better. Everything, every obstacle out of their way. Now, again, the thought is for you to decide whether the child would be able to overcome uh, any kind of obstacle in life later on. What about the perseverance? What about the resilience that the child needs to develop? The child has to uh, overcome their obstacles, respond to failures in their own way. You can't always keep mowing the lawn for them. So lawn mower parent. So remember, no, tiger was first, helicopter, lawnmower. I have lots more. Jellyfish. And this is a favorite with all the children these days. A parent who's a friend, a parent who's soft, warm. I'm not harsh on my children. I don't care for the grades that they get. I don't, uh, you know, pressurize them because, you know, pressure is very bad. So there are parents who have taken the opposite of the tiger parenting in a very different manner. They have left go. They have said, Ki, okay, leave it. The children do not need any of my, uh, you know, strictness, any kind of regulations, any kind of rules. They just need to grow, blossom uh, like a flower, you know, so that way. But then what are you doing? If you do not have structures, if you do not have boundaries, if you do not have limitations or routines, and there are no, there's no structure in a child's life. They do whatever they want to, whenever they want to, then what is happening? How are they going to define themselves to the roles and responsibilities that would be expected out of them when they grow up? So simply, when you are getting pushed around, I've had parents when I have been a teacher since 26 years, an educator after that, a school head after that. So imagine if I'm a school head as a principal, my parents used to come and tell me, my child doesn't listen to me at all. In fact, my child hits me if I try to stop him to do anything. So I had even seen it when the child, a parent, a child, mother is coming to drop the child to the school, the child is pulling her hair, hitting her and everything. And the parent is just taking it because she's so helpless. Don't get into that helpless situation. Today, the child is five, six. Tomorrow, do you think with a teenager, with this kind of a parenting, would you be able to cope up? This is the elephant style parenting. This I recently got. This is the one who would not focus on their academics or anything because that's bad. They have understood that, that that causes anxiety and depression. So it's only social, emotional upbringing and development that they are bothered about. 
So as a parent, I'm only nurturing the social and emotional side of to my children and not actually getting into the other aspects. Hmm. Then this is one of the difficulties that I have seen mostly in most of the households and that is conflicting parenting style between the father and the mother. And they both are right and they don't both don't want to agree to each other. So one one would be the tiger parent, the other would be helicopter parent or a jellyfish parent. So one is tiger, one is jellyfish. My God, how do they live together? And what happens to the poor child? The poor child is always in the center with two different kind of parenting styles conflicting with each other. So that's a very, this I can say is a very destructive parenting style. Both of you as parents- Please try to conclude. Yeah, yeah, to... sure, 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 sure. So please try to make it up uh, and you know come up with a similar parenting style for your child. And these are some quotes for you. You'll get it on Google, I'll not get into it. But uh, I love what Sue Atkins says because she's such a great parenting mentor that there's no such thing as a perfect parent. So just be a real one, okay? All these three have to be avoided. Uninvolved, permissive and authoritarian. What you need to be is, okay, these are too much. This will take me an hour. Uh, let me go quickly. Be authoritative. And just take a screenshot of the points here because I'm not going into details. Otherwise, Amrit is going to just uh, mute me. So imagine Lion King, be the lion parents in tandem with each other, letting the children go, hunt for themselves, live their life. Next set of parents can be the dolphin parents who are there, playful, flexible, nurturing. Yes. So too much love. Remember, this is my favorite quotation. Too much love never spoils the child. Children are spoiled when you substitute your presence for presents and gifts and bribes. So be there for your children. Thank you very much. And before Amrit could give me another glaring glance, here I go. So be there for your children. Thank you, Smriti. I think wonderfully presented. Love the graphics that you showed us. And I think you've given us some, some different uh, parenting styles all related to animals. And I think that was put across very well in front of most, most of the parents rather than the regular authoritarian uh, uninvolved. So wonderfully presented. I think very heart touching, uh, trig mind triggering for sure. So I'm sure parents, you would like to, to get a hold of what Smriti has said, and I'm sure you're going to be working on your parenting styles in the future. Very creative, Smriti. Thank you so much. We would have loved to hear a lot more from you. So uh, moving on, uh, we're going to be doing some fun activities right now, because as parents, like Smriti said, you also got to be one of the fun parent also, right? So we've got our next lot of speakers. I'm going to be presenting some fun games for all of us. So I would like to invite Ms. Fatima Larik from the UAE. She's a Montessori directress, a trainer, and a speaker who loves to speak on mental development and physical development of children. We also have with her Ms. Kathy Singh. She is a award-winning curriculum planner, and she's also been an early years educator, and she's been working with Little Millennium Schools. So we welcome both of you. Uh, we hope you're going to be taking on the fun session for today. So over to you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. So all ready for a fun quiz, a little, you know, something fun for the parents. I think we all had so much of information today. So we can take a little break and a little fun, right? So I think my partner, Sana, is here. here. Hello, Sana. So we will be starting. Are you all ready? So it is more because we are doing an online game. So we have planned some quiz and some riddles and some quiz which are just, you know, make sure that, oh, are we doing exactly some reading some stories to our children or not? Are we doing enough fun with our children or not? So let's start. I'm going to start and Sana is also going to be there with me. So with yeah, every sure. quiz. Hi, Ms. Kathy. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. With every quiz, we'll be giving you 30 seconds to answer it. So maybe you can mute yourself and answer us or you can just, uh, you know, answer us on the chat, right? So here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Just give me a second. Yes.
Yes. Is my screen visible to everybody? Yes. yes thank you. Visible. So life is more fun if you play games. So here we add some fun to us, right? Here, the first one, an easy one with our early childhood. Name that story. So I'm going to give you a biscuit runs away and is chased by lots of people and animals. He tries to cross over a river with the help of Sneaky Fox. Which story is it? Come on, parents and teachers and all the educators. Come on, you can mute yours, unmute yourself and answer us. And your 30 seconds starts now. Gingerbread man. Oh, yeah, you all are so quick. Very nice. Yes, it is gingerbread man. Thank you. Thank you. So that I think that's my favorite and a lot of children's favorite, the gingerbread man. Let's go to the next one. I think Sana will be doing that. It's again a rhyme. Yes. Which animal laughed as the cow jumped over the moon? You know, I think there's so many animals. Which one will laughed? Mm. Time is on. Sorry, let's, sorry. Remember, let's remember the rhyme, Smithy, Mandy. Not the, little dog. the little dog laughed. Yeah, yes. Yeah, right. answer. Very good. A big heart to you. Thank you for remembering the poem. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Are we all ready? Let's see. This very quiz is quick, right? Oh, now you need to tell me the name of this country. It's a rebus puzzle. Can we do it? The time starts now. You're 30 seconds on. And then I'm going to tell you the answer. Yes, yes, yes. Quickly. Dr. Vasavi can try. Let's see. Yeah. I already so many chats. There are a lot of people posting in the uh, chat, chat box. box. Please check oh, is it in the box. chat box? Madagascar. Um, <laughs> yes. yes wow. right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think I'm not able to see the chat box, but maybe, you know. Okay, let me see. Okay, yes. Oh, wow, so many. Thank you. The next one here, let's go. Yes, it's again a country. This is a very easy one, right? Sana? Can you work out which country is shown by these images? Yes, yeah, so very easy, quite Japan. easy. Japan. Japan. Yeah, Japan. Uh, yes. That's so great. Yes. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is again a country's name. This country gave us Harry Potter and the Cuddle, the Paddington Bear, consulting detective Sherlock Holmes and Robin Hood, who kept things fair. You so, can yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> it's I think great. we're winning. <laughs> we all know this, right? Which is the country? I think I didn't hear it. Did I miss it? Did UK, somebody answer it? United Kingdom. United yes, Kingdom. England. Yes, United Kingdom. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I you. Okay. Very good. Let's go. You all are so quick. Let's see the next one. Okay, my screen is stuck. Let me just yeah. This is a rebus puzzle. What do you what does this image tell you? What do you think? What is the phrase or the word? Rethink. Mm. Rethink. No. Thinking in not, the box. No, no. Not thinking in the box. Somewhere near. Somewhere near. Or out of the box? Out of the box. Yes. Thinking out of the box. Yes. That's what we all amazing, do. Amazing. Yes. That's what we all do. All our educators yeah. need to think out of the box. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Yes. So which one is this? Top secret. Top secret. Oh, Top this secret. is too easy. I thought it's going to be hard, but it's too Top easy. Okay, let's go to the next one then. Are we ready? Let's go. Okay, this is a word that you need to make out. Uh, can you find the nine letter word? Community? Yes, correct. Wow, correct. Okay, here we go. We thought we are going to kill some time, but it's so quick that I have to make, you know, find some more quiz. <laughs> okay, here, the next one. This one is between, the lines. Yes. between the lines. Yeah. Yes, between, yeah. between the lines. Okay, let's go to the next one. This again, a nine letter again, word. Again, the letter. Chocolate. 
all the chocolate goes to, the, to you know so quick yes the chocolate everyone's favorite amazing 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 a big clapping to all of you so quick they all are very smart <laughs> let's go to the next one okay now let's see i this is a riddle born in an instant i tell all stories i can be lost but i never die what am i an idea somewhere near to an idea but right. someone who tells the stories is it a photograph um no somewhere near yeah but it is you know it is born an instant somewhere what? there a thought yeah it is born an instant but it doesn't tell you stories i can be lost but i never die book story book mm, no imagination? not story. imagination no imagination yeah it can be born an instant but you know i'm i'm looking for a, a particular word that you know you think about it and it's a story starts you know it it has stories mm, with it idea. Dream, ideas dream dream no no something to ideas yes it's very near to idea yeah, near to idea there's a very famous song nowadays oh. with the same word yes let's think we all are very very near time to proceed to wind up yes. two minutes left yeah 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 i think the answer is the, the song by maroon memories they are born in instant and they all tell stories i can be lost but i never die memories right memories do tell us all the stories okay let's go quickly go to the next yes sana can do this one sana yes i am an odd number take away one letter and i become even what number am i guess the number yes it's an odd number and you take, take away one. one letter and i become even when number am what number i am i seven seven excellent yeah, excellent i think now we have Seven. one more and then we are done let's go to the okay this one is tricky you need to tell me the number of the squares you see in this picture quickly let's start counting should we count i see some of you are counting let's see what's the number in the chat box do i see any number 27. in the chat box um no some in here near to it. it's between 35 and 41 let's see i'm giving a hint 35 no no 36 no 38 no 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 yes let's keep going we might get to the number i see 36 38 mandy and julie murnati says 36 very near to 38 yes 40 right 40. yes the answer is 40 mary right 40 thank you let's see i see i have one more no do we have one more minute amrit just one last quiz 30 seconds left yes which fruit is the most popular and consumed in the world the most it's an easy one a fruit that is loved and eaten the most around the world apple apple mm, no no mostly children likes more Yes, yeah, children will love. Some of the children banana. love. Banana. Yes, Mandy says banana. banana in that. Yes, banana. Yes, yes, banana. Thank you so much. The I had an intelligent, super intelligent audience who was so quick. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sana and Kathy. There was some very interesting and highly <laughs> engaging for our audience. Wonderful thank riddles. You. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank we were you. sure that we didn't get one or two there, but most <laughs> of them very intelligent audience. We could guess all of them. Yes. All right. So let's move on. I hope all of you all had fun. Now we move on. Thank you, Kathy and Sana. We move on to the next session now. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Thank you. Our next session is going to be on parent participation, and we have a few parents who are here who would like to participate. Uh, a very interesting session on the topic of practical tips on how to manage preschoolers online with their online schooling, especially for working mothers. 
I think very relevant for today's times. And it, this discussion is going to be chaired by Ms. Priti Agarwal. Uh, along with her, we've got Ms. Shamali Shetty, who's an energetic and a compassionate multitasker, as well as a parent. Ms. Dipti Bali, she's a friend, philosopher, guide, and educator herself. And she's going to be coming and giving some tips to uh, the other parents, especially those who are working. And we have Runoti Pujari, who's also a preschool educator, a mother, and loves to work with children. Over to you, Smriti. Yeah, thank you so much, Amrit. I don't know, I was having so much fun with uh, Kathy and Sana uh, that uh, I just forgot everything that I had to do this. Okay, so guessing was really fun at that time. A lot of dopamine released, you know, feeling so good. Now, so we have these three parents with us. All the three of them are educators as well as mothers, and they have been going through uh, the pandemic on their own in very different manners. So I would like them to talk about a very practical parenting scenario that they have been going through with their children and online parent uh, in online schooling, as well as because all the three have been working mothers. So how have they coped up with uh, online schooling as well as working themselves, looking after the house when there were no helps, house helps also allowed inside the houses and what so do you do if there are multiple devices required in the house? So there are some very, very practical issues which we have not, you know, addressed as parents right now. In this parenting summit, we wanted to give parents a voice and see the difficulties that they are facing and how they have overcome so that the other parents can get inspired and get some practical tips on this. So first and foremost, I invite Ms. Deepti Bali to, uh, you know, voice her thoughts on this and how has she coped up I, she has a five-year-old at her home and currently we can congratulate her because she's on the family way again and must we're going to have the next one very soon so in this one and a half years Ms. Deepti how did you manage uh, the online schooling of your daughter and your work first of all I would like to thank ECDF and Ms. Smriti for giving me an opportunity to present my thoughts. In fact, present what I have been doing. Honestly, getting a chance to present made me feel a little successful today. Or at least I'm presenting it somewhere. Having said that, I would uh, first of all... Sikti, could you be a little louder, please? Okay, now is it yeah, better? Much better, much better. Uh, is it better this way without the headphones? It's okay. better. Okay, so I'll prefer not to use the headphones. So just to begin, uh, basically when I was thinking how to share about it, I made an acronym for parenting. How this parenting worked for me in this lockdown where P was planning ahead, A was allocating and appreciating, R was routine, E was engaging my little one, N was new innovations, T was talking to my little one, I was informed changes, N was negotiating boundaries, and G was got to work in their space. So just to give some ready tips on this, when I said plan ahead, uh, some ready tips included planning ahead of what was the child's routine because yeah, it was a struggle with no house helps around, sudden lockdown, kids who used to be out jumping, uh, they, did, they couldn't go out. So we as mothers had to plan ahead, not only for the kid, for the kitchen, for the work. So I used to make it a point to plan in advance. Then allocating and appreciating. I used to allocate some small tasks to my daughter so that she, again, she feels that she is being appreciated and she is my helper friend. Much of it might sound similar to what Ms. Deepa said. I felt as if she was uh, like... Uh, talking my feelings out so yeah i used to allocate some tasks to her it could be something as as small as folding the clothes keeping the dishes in the kitchen or anything and yes appreciating her because that helped to distract my child from her anxiousness because children went very anxious to know the why and at that time we all were clueless when the lockdown happened then the routine, it was a sudden change of routine for the children. 
so even in that sudden change where it could be that i am on my laptop in the kitchen the child had to be attended in some way or the other so set a certain routine for the child it could be a routine where your child is first doing the play time and then doing your study time that's absolutely okay then engaging as per the age level which was very very important the child being 3 or a 4 year old had to be engaged because they were very used to going to one of these schools where they were always engaged with creativity with thinking logical thinking sharing their perspective so they had to be engaged in a task where they could involve themselves and just not telling them to do okay sit down and start playing with your blocks what to play what did you make having those discussions so those were very important then during the course as the lockdown increased i realized that my child was doing so many things appreciation was happening but what about something which could give a kick to my child that was new innovations so there was a time when i made it a point that okay even she was four, that time she was 4 years old i would bring in some new innovation so what i used to do i used to go on pinterest find some new activities and evening hours at least half an hour or 40 minutes or 20 minutes i used to do some new innovations with the little one so that she is having a kick start that yeah something new is coming to her then talking as ms deepa also rightly said it was very important to calm down her anxiousness to give her a rationale that why is it happening why suddenly everything is at a halt why she can't go to a day care why mama is working on the laptop in the house so talking to the child at certain points and talking what is truth no fake promises no false commitments that was very important then informed changes for an example tomorrow morning i have a very important meeting i might be logged in the guest room please when you get up be comfortable with that so this really helped my little one to be mentally prepared one more important thing about the informed changes was that they will not be able to meet their teachers physically because for a preschooler hugging holding hands just going and kissing the teacher probably is one of the closest way to express so these changes were to be informed that another 15 days you might not meet another 15 days and that is still exceeding then negotiating boundaries i think for this more than my child i had to specify myself i had to negotiate certain boundaries that it's okay if she is on tab but constructively even on tab so i had to negotiate boundaries for screen time i had to tell myself that devika not negative tumar holle ekhon so then the last thing was got the work in their workspace as a mother as an educator as a parent i had to be respectful towards the fact that this room belong to the family this was her space due to this pandemic i have brought in my work into her space so the first place for the child is to make to ask the child to make the child comfortable in their space so this is all what we did i literally used to ask my daughter is it okay if i move your table a little bit there and fit in my table besides you so that we both can work parallelly because it is as adults we who brought home the work for them when mamma was home mamma was totally there yes yes exactly miss deepthi that's the point so respect your children and uh, you know involve them uh, constructively even in the daily chores even also respect them to at least ask them if you're making changes and inform them informed changes is something that is very very important and uh, now we go to the next mother and see hear her thoughts so miss munati um, Ms. Murnati Pujari, we would like to hear from you. How did you manage? And Murnati uh, has been a COVID survivor, so she was with her six-year-old daughter, where uh, Murnati and her husband they both were down with COVID, 
and they were with the with the daughter they were secluded isolated and everything was on them yes ms murnathi what do you have to share with us yeah so i all and thanks for the opportunity uh, actually uh, yes covid and parenting uh, it has kind of brought and uh, what a revolution uh, evolution both in terms of uh, how a parent should be and how a parenting should happen <clears throat> so yes covid struck uh, first it was uh, my kid then it was the two of us and uh, when you know uh, the mother who is a educator generally kind of as deepthik correctly mentioned you know we kind of did so many activities otherwise with other that children and when uh, you covid struck you know you kind of you can't even get up so uh, how about uh, doing things with your child so that is when uh, you know it was difficult in terms of i didn't want to give them mobile but i didn't have a choice i i kind of had to do it because i couldn't get up so uh, it was like you know to strike a balance uh, and negotiating negotiating boundaries for yourself was so important so so important that uh, first i had to kind of pacify myself that it's okay like that's the need of the hour if uh, you know she had worksheets she had books beyond a point she would get um, bore ho raha hai bore ho raha hai so then what do you do so you give her a story to read and then i found out apps which are so many uh, uh, you know available which have so much of constructive uh, knowledge also in terms of developing their abilities skills so i then kind of uh, you know kind of made a um, made myself pacified with, uh, by saying that okay you know i mean i kind of have a balance between the two uh, have her do uh, like you know look at the mobile but with activities that kind of i uh, want her to do which i cannot do at that time with her so something like that and then a uh, lot of uh, small little things helped in terms of you know uh, setting a routine like uh, let's <coughs> so i learned uh, things like whatever that she wanted to do say if she wants to do some art then what's a quick trick that i can a kind of you know when i am not able to sit for more than 5 minutes or 10 minutes what is a trick that i can do to help her uh, in those 10 minutes that i'm sitting so again pre planning yes while i was sleeping also i was kind of on mobile searching you know what can i do with her when that that 10 minutes are going to come you know when i'm going to sit and i'm going to do something with her so yeah um, uh, she understood a lot of online things because i couldn't sit with her for her classes so uh, she understood how to switch on her laptop how to you know the entire uh, format the schools helped a lot so yes uh, that was kind of really really uh, for me at least it was a good help because the school never made it mandatory for the parents to sit and you know the parents should be there uh, they kind of took over took over everything like if you know if they asked whether the parent is sitting if not even at the initial uh, days of the school they would kind of manage with uh, whatever that the child wanted or didn't have like because i couldn't we couldn't go out we couldn't get anybody uh, you know hardly deliveries were happening for stationeries and things like that at the time <laughs> so if something we needed then you know she was like stranded because she didn't have it so then yeah. uh, the teachers kind of made way for that as well if you don't have this then use this so today <laughs> if i have to tell her that you know uh, dia we don't have this at home she would be like no worry we have this no we can make do with this so she's kind of figured out a way for herself yeah uh, so alternatives is yeah what she's kind superb, of superb superb miss murnathi that was really really nice and good, lot of takeaways from there first is the school and parent partnership if the school understands that the parent is going through a lot and we should not be so stringent or so strict with them that you know you have to do certain certain things with the children it really really helps and alternatives absolutely i think we all understood the meanings of alternatives in, in this pandemic that you know if you don't get this what can you do what else what are the options now we have been now we have lots of options for everything thank you so much for sharing your thoughts this was very really, really thanks. wonderful miss shamila with you uh, you have to grown up kids and you are a teacher yourself 
and with your hus husband also working. Now, so did you have four devices on Wi-Fi? Uh, did you have everybody online at the same time? Or were there flexibilities? How did you manage the routine and how did you plan it? Unmute yourself. Ms. Shamila, please un unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello everyone. Thank you, Smriti ma'am, for having me over here. Thank you everyone for your lovely tips. Okay, yes, Smriti ma'am, I have two grown-up kids, one child who's just completed 18 years. So he's a teenager, <laughs> another one he she is 11 years old. So then we had a topsy turvy world when the uh, lockdown started. And uh, I used to teach the morning shift. My daughter would have the afternoon. So after me, the laptop would go to her. And then she would do her class. After her class, I would take the laptop and then finish up my schoolwork. So then, and my son would do his work, a schooling with his phone. So then initially, yes, it was, we all were adjusting. And as a family, uh, we were all adjusting and helping each other because online school for me, it was a totally new thing. And they and children are phone geeks, laptop geeks. They used to tell me, am I a noob? I was like, I don't know what is this. So they used to actually come and help me. And, you know, to be very frank, during this time, I've had such wonderful bond with my children. My son, imagine, he plays seven hours football and cricket, and I had to lock him down at home. Oh, my gosh. So then for me, it was a difficult task. So then what I did is I saw what their interests like and keep them engaged. So my son is like, why not, Amma, let me start driving. Was like, why not? You can do that. So I was with him. I used to finish my class. Okay, Emma, I want to go and get this thing. I'll come with you. So this is how he started driving. And today I know my son that he can drive anywhere safely. So I did not, I need not worry about it. With my daughter, I had to keep her engaged. She has started baking. So you know, she bakes lovely cookies. Yes, <laughs> I will definitely give it with you. And now yeah. what she has started is she has started baking for her pets, her dog. So this is down one year of the line. I've seen my children grow. So, you know, I, I tell all the parents, I would suggest all the parents, be with your children, listen to them, have a chit chat with them, know what they want to do. You know, right. you will learn, they will learn from you, you will learn from them. There are a lot of things which, you know, you are imparting education among themselves. When you have a hear to listen, they will always have something to say. So that is what I would tell all parents. Be with your children. Listen to them. They have lots to tell about. In fact, you know, we as elders, there are things, times we think that only we can educate them. But then I say kids, they are more faster than us in today's world and they educate us a lot. So it's a it's a family thing, what I feel. And this is how my pandemic has been wonderful. And uh, yes, there has been ups and downs, but then I feel uh, this is it's great. So that's great. Oh, thank you so much, Shamila. That was a brilliant takeaway. And that is that, you know, you if you listen to your children and you make learning a two-way process, that you're learning from them and they're learning from you, then there were so many new things that you people invented during the pandemic. Hats off to you. So routines and structures, helping each other, believing and respecting each other as a parent and a child. I think our two keynote speakers talked about bridging the gap and managing anxiety. These, there are these three parents who did it beautifully. Yes. Over to you, Amrit. Thank you, Smriti, and the parents for sharing this session and uh, the parents' wonderful uh, memories that you've shared of your pandemic days. And I'm sure that that has been something wonderful that each one of us has learned from you and cherished that how we could evolve as parents and you know mutually co coexist in the same world as our children so thank you so much Smriti and the other parents uh, we move on to another fun session one session that i'm looking forward for is the story kapitara and this session 
we have a storyteller, Miss Niyati Vidya Mehta, who is the storyteller and a founder of Storybox by Niyati. So Niyati, over to you. Yeah, thank you so very much. Uh, first of all, you know, it's not very rosy to start with the story not, note, but then I'm running short of the time. I'm traveling from Ahmedabad to Mumbai. So I have thrown all, all people out in the heat and I'm sitting in the car <laughs> to address you. So I have very limited time now, uh, but I understand that every step is very important. And the alterations we just spoke about, so this is one of the alterations. <laughs> We all have to learn the alteration. Now, quickly coming to the story. Um, I have two of my own children and I have many story children. So when this pandemic struck, uh, it was very difficult for me to handle myself, understand my children, the new scenario, plus my story children and their parents. So it was that time looked as a Herculean task that, you know, uh, I'm doing multitasking. I'm a buy also, like I'm a maid, I'm a cook, I'm a mother, I'm a uh, in-house, you know, wife. Uh, I have to look after, manage everyone, everyone's time and everything. On the top of that, I had to look after my story children plus my story parents. And very important thing we all found was how to keep our children busy. See, storytelling, yes, we can do. But for them, it has kind of become, you know, for parents and children, it has become a nighttime routine. It's not daytime. I mean, story in the daytime, then a story auntie would do, a story ma'am will do. Parents cannot do storytelling in the morning, you know, it is just a bedtime uh, routine for them. So that was a kind of query I kept on getting. So I, uh, you know, look forward to many of activity based stories. So good that I've got, uh, you know, parents here, so I could, you know, talk my heart out here. But uh, yes, so this is one of the stories I learned uh, from one of my storyteller friends from Singapore. Uh, her name is Sheila V. And she learned it from her Russian storyteller friend. So this is a story where there were two eternal enemies. One was a lizard and another was a snake. The snake was always out looking for the lizard to eat. And the lazy lizard. Though being lazy, used to find out some or the other way to hide out. Well, time just went by and passed by till the lizard was alert. But one summer morning, it was a hot, hot morning. Just like today in Ahmedabad. It's so hot and sweating. And the lizard started feeling drowsy. You know, it happens at times when it is so hot, then also you feel a little lazy, a little down, and you feel that let's go and have, you know, a little nap. Well, the lizard was feeling exactly the same. Her eyes were going down. He was yawning, but he wanted to be alert because the snake would have come from any size, any time. So, though he was sleepy, he, he didn't sleep. He didn't sleep. But it was a hot, hot morning. He was very sleepy. No, I can't sleep, he told to himself. The snake can come from any size. From any any time, I have to be alert. I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I can't sleep. But it is a hot, hot summer morning. Oh, you never know. Even the snake is sleeping somewhere. I can't sleep. So badly.
watch it tell you the lizard actually slept and the snake was right there looking for its prey when the snake came he saw the lizard sleeping so slowly and gradually he laid himself on the lizard do you think the lizard came to know he was sleeping he took the chance and wound himself around the lizard but do you think the lizard came to know he was in his dream land he again laid himself on the lizard and now he knew that the lizard cannot move that easily but the lizard still was sleeping he took the chance and again slowly and gradually kept himself over the lizard and now the clutch is little tight and the lizard is so uncomfortable and he said ah, what is this what is this <gasps> sleep oh, oh please leave me please leave me for this time please please this is so tight please leave me for this time i promise i'll never be you know so you uh, know like this and carefree and i'll not sleep ever again <laughs> this makes it do you think i'm going to let my sabade lunch like that i could not let you go like that but now as you are in my clutch a nap is a must and the sleep went to sleep the lizard coughed himself so much why did i sleep and look what i have put myself into or oh, sleep leave me he couldn't do anything at all then he saw someone coming ah oh, it was none other than his own daughter and he shouted daughter daughter please come here and save me father the daughter was aghast looking the father so trapped she got really confused what to do how to help and she ran towards him saying father what happened and how did this happen i just went a little crazy for a nap and see what i put myself into father don't worry let me help you she came and she pushed sorry, pulled and pulled and pulled the snake but the clutch was very tight it was not easy for a lizard daughter to take it away she gathered all the strength and she snatched she snatched her and snatched and fetched she got tired she looked into the eyes of his father and her father her first hero was in trouble who always helped her to come out of the trouble she couldn't take it she prayed to god and she gathered all the courage all the might she had and she went again to snatch and free her father from the clutch of that snake and there the snake went quickly she ran towards her father and then both of them went and hid themselves under the bushes the snake then came to know that the spray is no more there he kept on looking for him but well to best of my knowledge he has yet not got caught of that lizard yet 
<laughs> so here is the end of the story. I hope you have liked it. I thought I would have time to teach you the trick, but I'm really sorry I'm falling short of time. But you can always go to my YouTube channel called Storybox by Niyati. And there is the story there and you can learn this trick. So learn and tell this story to everyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suti. Thank you for Thank having you, me over. Niyati. It was a wonderful story. And I think I was really looking forward for this. And you could see all the comments and the hearts and the likings that all the partners <laughs> Surely I'll go through Very, that. very, very expressive funny too you, and a very <laughs> simple prop to be used so parents yes, you really do not yes. need uh, many more props or puppets yes exactly that was one of the agendas yes thank you miss right. Niyati thank, thank you once again so much thank you. a wonderful yeah, thank question you you thank you yeah oh bye bye your expressions were phenomenal oh thank you so much <laughs> Now it's time to move forward. We're going to be having another panel discussion for all of you. And this panel discussion is going to be on a very important topic. The topic for today's panel discussion is on supporting children to balance between online and co-curricular activities. Now we will be having Ms. Sharin Ratranani who will be chairing this session. She's the co-founder of Kitty Planet Montessori School in Indonesia. Our speakers for today's panel are Michelle Popotnis. She's an expertise and experienced in planning, implementing in early childhood program. She comes with immense experience and is an expert at training teachers and conducting workshops. So welcome Michelle Pa. We've got Miss Mandy, who's a co-founder of Mini Minds Matter UK, and Abigail Kerr, who is also been teaching and training and in specializes in early years teacher training, managing schools, and setting up children under the age of six. Over to you, speakers. We're looking forward for this panel, and welcome to ECDF. Thank you so much, um, Amrit, and thank you, Dr. Vasavi and ECDF. I think we've had a fantastic time of the last how many ever hours? I don't know, I've lost track of time because it was so packed with inspiration and ideas. So thank you to everyone. And um, like Amrit just interview, I mean, introduced the panelists. I think we've got a house full of experts with years and years of experience. And I'm looking forward to spark a conversation between these experts and thought leaders. And I'm sure everyone listening is going to take away some expert opinions and perspectives, right? So let's get started. Um, it is a very important topic, I think, and very, I think every parent and educator, every caregiver can resonate with this online learning and extracurricular activities. How do we draw the balance? How do we support parents to do this? So I'm gonna um, uh, guide the panelists with a few questions. And my first question being, um, I think we'll ask Shilpa to answer this. Shilpa, what is your view on the current online classes for children, which, is, which seems like it's been going on and we don't know when it's gonna completely end. What's your view on this? What's your take? You're muted, Shopa. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Shireen, and thank you, Dr. Vasavi and ECDF for having me on this panel here. Uh, well, when you talk of online education, and we are specifically talking of uh, preschoolers here. So um, when we talk of online education and preschooling, of course, we all know COVID-19 hit us, took us unaware, and we've had to literally fast forward the entire generation to the next level into the digital world within what a few days uh, when, uh, when lockdown hit India especially and um, uh, which otherwise might have taken another a decade maybe for us to reach to that level it was literally as if we made a we had to do a hundred meter dash to get to that goal and all the teachers and educators really pushed and obviously did a tremendous job entire teaching faculty had to work towards it and they did a commendable job of last academic year uh, managing the whole show 
And of course, for this academic year, they're all set, already started the sessions, uh, delivering the lessons as they come. Uh, coming to my personal views regarding this online format for preschool education, we all agree and I agree. However, I may not agree 100%, but digital is the way forward. We know and we've accepted it. So even if I say I'm not 100% into it, I guess that's the way forward for all of us. And that's the one of the ways where I'm beginning to interact with so many learned educators from across the globe. So that is a wonderful thing. So we are talking of a digital way forward for preschool education also. Now, uh, how I view this in early years is uh, we all have been a part of this online implementation or we have been at the receiving end of the online education in the past one, one and a half year. Um, this format has been successful in some cities and some uh, schools. I'm talking from Indian perspective in India and may not have been so very successful in many other cities and schools. Now, majorly why this has been I'm I'm focusing on the positive of why it has been successful. One of the reasons I found is majorly the teacher training and the IT support that was provided by the schools and the management. That helped the teachers to take it to that level in a fast way. Um, of course, teachers also, the attitude and skills of the teachers worked very well where they were very flexible and innovative with, with their lessons. Having said this about the teachers, we cannot and we do not need, uh, look at ignoring the parental support. And without that parental support, this definitely would not have been possible. The online education would not be possible. So the kind of support the parents have provided uh, where this online education has been successful is immense. And uh, again, really, I would say appreciate the parents at that front, because despite their own schedules and all what Miss Deepti and the other parents were talking of how what the challenges they faced, it is really uh, commendable with the work they did with their children, along with the uh, whatever uh, platform that they were connected to. Uh, of course, what helped many schools and uh, institutions was the open discussions that they had with parents, online open discussions. Uh, by taking in the feedback from the parents and incorporating them into their online sessions, which worked for them very effectively as well as efficiently. And we all know this was not, all this was not smooth sailing, definitely not a smooth sailing. For a teacher to move to from a chalk and board classroom or a play-based methodology or activity-based curriculum to suddenly move to an online uh, mode has not been easy. It's not been easy and it was riddled with challenges. Uh, um, I think Ms. Deepti Bali spoke about and other parents spoke about the challenges at, as parents that they faced and respect and accept all the challenges that the parents faced. The teachers too faced a lot of challenges. We all agree to that. To begin with, we all know it was the IT know-how and the infrastructure. Teachers were struggling with that in the beginning. Yes, uh, They were spoiled for choices earlier with their teaching aids. When you're in a school setup, you have abundant teaching aids which are using suddenly these teachers had to focus on what was available in their kitchens or in the home and use them as teaching aids so they really had to work on that aspect observations and review of children work children's work which is a integral part of any preschool uh, curriculum or pedagogy that is still a questionable uh, aspect for me uh, then from parents, from teachers perspective, there was human, uh, there was huge pressure on teachers because they were being monitored and observed by the parents on a daily basis now. So there yes. was no scope for faltering there. So right. that was a huge pressure on the teachers, I felt, which the teachers have just taken off beautifully and done a wonderful job. Uh, Besides that, of course, parents, as the parents, three learned parents spoke about the pressures that they had and the challenges they had to face was huge. But having said that, yes, the, this was the some cities and some schools, then there are some unfortunately setups in India 
where the children have not been fortunate, so fortunate to get any kind of online education, especially at the preschool level. I have been working with certain organizations where I do online or telephonic sessions with children and half the time either the child is not available or the phone is not available with the child because the older child is using the phone. Uh, forget laptops and iPads. It's just a phone because there's no connectivity. Right. I'm doing phone Absolutely. telephonic sessions yeah. with them. Right. So but, uh, you have know, Shufa, missed out yeah. on a whole lot. Okay, absolutely. I get, you know, uh, what you shared. There's been a real immense learning curve, a very steep learning curve for teachers and parents. And now the thing is that when that learning curve happened, it was about getting children to do their academics, academics, and academics. The whole focus went on to academics, and suddenly all the extracurricular was pushed aside for a very long time till you had teachers, until you had everybody else say, right, okay, now this is working. And now how do we get that extracurricular on there? And how do we balance that? And is it going to be digital on, right? So uh, going to, you know, going from that, uh, I'd like to ask um, Abby, what's your view, Abby, you know, about extracurricular activities and how could parents now, after going through this whole learning curve and learning how to be the teacher at home, how could parents support children now to go from this academic learning into having extracurricular how important was it to bring in that extracurricular and how do you think parents would support children to have a good balance between the two Ah, yes, thanks, Shireen. Yeah, thank you. Also, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's lovely to have this chat with you because, I mean, it's very current, but also feels like a little bit in the past for me, because in Hong Kong, for example, we are not online anymore in the early years at all. Um, so <laughs> we did have a stint of online and it was challenging for people. Um, but interestingly, when we talk about extracurricular activities, we are talking about something that's additional to the curriculum. Not that it's, it shouldn't really, an extracurricular activity is not related to the curriculum. But if we talk about co-curricular activities, co-curricular activities are related to the curriculum. So they're actually a bit different if we think about them, but both are both uh, part of our education often um, and both important. Um, but if you think about co-curricular activities, things like, you could say like science-based, activities, science fairs or storytelling activities that um, are additional but go alongside a curriculum, I think they came across, particularly in my experience of this online learning, they came across quite regularly in that academic <laughs> um, focus. But the extracurricular activities, the, the things that are additional to the curriculum like gymnastics or yoga or dancing or football those kind of things were kind of missing for quite some time because and in Hong Kong I don't know about everywhere else you could let me know but the homes are quite small um, so actually moving around in a home and looking at a screen is quite challenging but the feedback I had from teachers for example was that those when they did when they figured out how to arrange their time they used their time quite wisely for those movement activities like yoga, um, mm -hmm. dancing every morning. And that would come, what they found was that children would be more engaged in those activities than anything mm. that was kind of academic, <laughs> where they would right. sit and need to listen to a teacher, which is quite interesting, I think. Yep. So Absolutely. What, what, yeah, and I think what something, if you talk about being meaningful and for support to parents is to think about your child I think what and ask them I think one of the uh, previous people who were just speaking were mentioning that to ask your children what their interests are or just observe them and listen to them if they're very young sometimes they can't verbalize that but finding out what it is first and then finding ways to do that and I always mm. advise parents to get outside <laughs> I know that we can't always in lockdown but we can say, let's look at a screen and listen to your teacher, but actually going outside, finding space, even using some of the ideas that the teachers give you um, to mm -hmm. use outside, you know, for those active um, dance moves, you know, yoga moves even, or just being outside in nature is going to be really supportive to, to the co-curricular right. or extracurricular. 
Right. Well, lovely. Thank you. I really like the, uh, you know, the, the, the discernment you made between co-curricular and extracurricular. And it's very interesting to see, but you know, how we place so much importance on academics that the first thing we take care of is the academics. And then, you know, there's like a priority list. And um, I like the way you spoke about how children actually enjoy the co-curricular, the extracurricular, because it's more engaging. It's perhaps more fun. You know, it's really um, learning more through play and learning more through child-directed uh, child activities. So, you know, the question is, why should we as educators or why should parents actually put that down on the list of priorities? You know, right on top is academics and we go slowly down the priority list and put this and how do you think maybe i can ask mandy to answer this mandy but how do you think uh you know children can have a balance between this academic learning which is yes you know from centuries since since education ever existed we are such an outcome-based society where we are looking at grades you know where a number takes you to a college academics academics is just the whole and soul of education but now we all know the sel the co-curricular the extracurricular gives the children an opportunity to actually uh, maybe express their own talents and abilities in different ways right so mandy what's your take on uh, how parents can actually strike a balance. So children do have this balance between the two. And, um, you know, there's, there's, they have the best of both worlds. Oh, lovely. Thank you. We're in the UK. And thank you so much, ECDF, for having us join you. It's lunchtime. It's the middle of the day here for us. I'm actually going to pass you to my colleague, Julie, because she actually runs two amazing preschool settings here in the UK. And I would love her to explain how we've been able to do that and get that balance for the children okay. during the lockdown period. And as you say, as we're kind of coming in and out of it in the UK, it's rather a um, you know a roller coaster at the moment of whether we're in lockdown and out of lockdown. But yeah, my colleague, Julie is an excellent, she's gonna speak to you about the balance and um, really reiterate some of the amazing things that have been said um, today already. Hi, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it was lovely to hear Abby and I absolutely resonate with what a lot of things Abby was saying. I have two settings. One setting I closed during lockdown, the other I kept open for key parents. And what was interesting about that is we offered online learning and we often, I obviously did the face-to-face -face with children in preschool. And I think some of your speakers have already said that presence, the parents and presence with your children is a key factor. And those preschool years are fundamental. We call them the early years, those uh, are amazing, that whatever you put into those children at those early years foundations, prepare them for adult life, whether that's going into an academic way, whether that's going into be something completely different, but that's what it prepares us for. And what we found, those children that we were able to engage with on a face-to-face -face basis, responded much better to those that had to look at online learning. And as we say, with those children with early years learning, it has to be engaging. You have to make it fun. You can't put academic work into children under five because they ultimately don't understand that. So you have to be very creative in your curriculum. And unfortunately, as you've already said, the curriculum is written from centuries ago. And we seem to keep going back to academic, academic, academic. But what does that mean? When we look at the Early Years uh, Foundation, children have to engage and get those face-to-face -face experiences to know what interests them. How do they know they can bake? How do they know they're great at listening to friends? How do they know they can build? How do they know they can paint? How do they know that they can read a story or listen to a story and understand the beginning, the middle and an end of the story? And they only learn that through those interactions. So it's been wonderful seeing those educators go online and try to facilitate that. But parents have to understand we have that balance because online learning doesn't look at mindset, doesn't look at social relationships, doesn't look at the creative side and certainly doesn't look at the physical side. And those children need to interact in all those things. We look at the prime areas of development, which are personal, social, communication and physical. How do we engage online with 
and, and meet their expectations and have an impact on children. So it is fundamentally important that parents have that time to say, you know, if we have to go online, we're going to do that for a certain period of time. And if they do a story or they hear a story online, as we've just heard, why don't they go and act that out themselves? Why don't they make their own story box? Why don't they go and plant something in the garden and bring something to life? Or go and speak about that story to, another, to the brother or sister, you know, to see if they can remember it and be able to retell that story. So for me, having that, you know, the fundamentals of both is absolutely imperative. I don't think the future is technology and digital age, especially for preschool children, but I accept that's the way that we are going. Um, I have written a phonics programme, which is all digital, but it doesn't mean it's going to have the same impact as having that face-to-face. -face. So really, that's how I'm going to conclude. So thank you Brilliant. for speaking. Some of you brought some fantastic things into this, um, and I hope Ugh. that it makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Julie, I think um, you brought a very important point and even I resonate with that. Though we have so much of technology and though the whole world is saying education is never going to be the same again because, you know, it's digital all the way ahead. But I think it's different for the early years. I think we all know that, you know, <clears throat> the brain is developing and all those neural connections are happening before the age of six. And yes, parents and educators can use all these digital uh, tools, like you mentioned, a phonics program. Use those digital tools, but really what matters is to bring that into a very engaging sensorial experience for children because every one of those things i mean even when we even when children touch their noses or we do there is a neural connection being built so i think um with the early childhood uh, platform it's going to be a little different and i think you know digital tools can be used for sure to get our work a little faster to share the resources that we have but I think the key, I like the word creative and engaging that you specifically spoke about. And I think if we bring that to little children, it's going to make a difference. So fantastic. Right. So my next question, which, um, which any one of the panelists can go ahead and answer is at what age do you think that these co-curricular activities should actually be introduced to such young children? And what would you think would be some of the, maybe one or two of the most important ones that you would introduce, or parents should introduce? I would say from, obviously from, from birth really, um, I like from, come from a health perspective, Julie and I work together um, mm -hmm. around emotional health and wellbeing and education. And we're combining that work that we do in the UK. So speaking from, um, that kind of emotional health perspective. Um, I work within Julie's nurseries in the baby room mm -hmm. and we bring in, um, like you say, those kind of fun um, activities. We might be playing with scarves or feathers, um, getting them to do the breathing techniques. Now, obviously the baby themselves might not be doing it, but the worker or now, and obviously we pass this on to the parents will be doing, like you say, maybe like you say, a fun story, um, and we're using feathers, we're using scars, we're using physical touch and breathing bubbles and all of those kind of things. And to me, that is so, so important from, from birth. Um, I'm also a foster parent. Um, we currently have a little 14 month old baby with us um, okay. who we've given all of that kind of, he's been in lockdown with us and I've not been able to get him maybe out and about as I would have done to some of the mother groups. Um, so it's bringing that into the home, isn't it? And the hands on touch is so important and going back to what Gila was saying and what we've all said there will be times where we're together <clears throat> where the children are online doing something but if we as the parent or the educator can be there with them and make it more physical so like you say there might be an online story but like the lady did before we might have some props we might be joining in with them um, I trained in a modality called story massage. So again, you're telling wow. a story that you might be physically doing like a weather report on the child's back where you're doing the rain and the sunshine and the clouds. And again, I love to share that with the baby. So yeah, that's some experience of mine that it, it can't start too young, really. Really? Oh, that's that. that mirror work as well. And, you know, that is actually fundamental. I think the first person who spoke was, 
Um, it's that role model. When children look at your face, they get those reactions. They, they look at how you react to them um, and copy everything you do. How do you do that through a computer? How do you do that? You know, and it has to be in person. Absolutely. I love that. It reminds me of, you know, the serve and return, um, you know, the whole way of developing the serve and return where you even, I mean, even now, if I smile at you, your nodding is giving me some kind of a prompt that you're even listening to me. So I think you're right. You know, that whole serve and return development is getting lost on the computer and uh, you know, listening to what you said about having such a rich sensorial experience, I hope the parents listening out there would pick up those ideas like story massage sounds brilliant. And like even just the story we had before this was so good. And I, I know some parents who have actually opted to take a gap year in preschool and actually just have children have total co-curricular, extracurricular for a whole year because they feel that, you know, let, let me let me take my child for a holiday and let him play at the beach and learn and let him just play. I don't need that curriculum, especially in countries like in Indonesia where it is not required to complete preschool to go into primary one, right? So what is your view on, on I mean, any of the panelists, what's your view on that? For those parents who've chosen, we don't need a balance, Okay, let's leave the online learning and let's take up the co-curricular, the extracurricular, and let's just do this, right? How do you so, think? Yep. That, yes, that Abby. That excites me. <laughs> I'm very happy about that because, and, and being in Hong Kong often, and I think maybe it's similar in Indonesia and maybe in India. Um, in the UK, I know it's a bit different, um, but the preschool education is children at two years old start to have academic learning where they sit down and have to listen to a teacher. And they also have homework when they get to three years old. And, and this is where the semantics of our discussion is quite important again. So co-curricular, extracurricular, in early years, they don't actually exist because what you do is you have learning. <laughs> and that learning oh. is wherever the child is and whoever they're with. So if a parent has decided to not send their child into a setting, then their child is going to learn in their experiences with their parent, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And I think one of the most important things that we as educators can do is if we have contact with parents and families is to show them, uh, guide them and train them and educate them in what are the best practices for early learning. And they will realize that they do not have to do that academic learning and they don't have to think about extracurricular or co-curricular activities at all. They just think about the experiences that they have with their child. Right, okay, brilliant. Ooh, Thanks, ooh. Abigail. Yeah, uh, Shana, you wanna add in, in India also a lot of parents that I know have been moving on to this kind of experience, what uh, you spoke of and not wanting to send kids to a preschool, taking that gap year. Uh, however, very few parents have uh, really taken up that. And as you mentioned, Abey, about the learning that has to happen, that is true. And if uh, the parent is willing to take up that, and there are a lot of now curriculums coming up, which are training the parents how to do that homeschooling aspect. So if that takes off, well, I think that would be wonderful rather than having an online session by, with the teacher where you're missing out on the hugs and the kisses with the kids. So that I, I agree with adds that. to the whole. Even though it's important to spend time with the parents, because I think having the right balance, I think you've got to look in that not every parent has the ability okay. to educate the children. And we find in the UK that those children that miss out on coming to preschool end up being two years behind their peers. Um, and they're usually from children from deprived backgrounds. So I think, you know, you have to get that balance right. And it isn't just about going to the beach, it isn't just about shopping. It's, you know, if you are going shopping, how many things are you put in the basket? If you take one away, what's left? You know, how much do you think it will cost? Let's guess, let's estimate. You know, it's that sort of thing. And if you're in, in on the beach and you, you're filling an empty in sand, which is heavy, which is lighter, you learn quantity from that, don't you? And it, it's being able to educate your children in that way. But I think there's nothing better than children's social relationships where they have to learn to take turns, negotiate boundaries, 
deal with conflicts at an early age, stand up for their own rights. And often they can't do that with parents. And as we've heard before, the different types of parenting often don't allow them to do that. And at the end of the day, we are preparing them for school as well. So it's having that balance. I'll always go back to having the right balance. Right. Um, br- brilliant point, Julie. You know, I was just listening to someone who uh, there was there a lot of parents who ask about this question, you know, like we can just take a break. But I think what you pointed out to is very, very important that children need to go to preschool because what they need is a professional to lead their learning. Right. And I think once they have a professional to lead their learning, the balance is getting parents to be adjacent or to be to be a parallel and to lead that learning at home. And as we've been seeing it, the success of this whole online learning has been so dependent on not only the online Zoom classes or whatever, but a parallel at home. And those who have been drawing a great parallel have had some real great success stories. But like you said, you might have, you know, some of those tiger parents or jellyfish parents, like um, <laughs> she mentioned, and, and they they have no, um, they, they don't find the need, neither do they have the patience to actually take on this role of being the educator. Right. So brilliant point made there. Right. So over to my next questions. Right. So in terms of helping children to draw this balance um, on, uh, you know, online and extracurricular or co-curricular activities, how can, how do you think we can guide parents on letting on teaching them or letting them know how much of online learning is important what is it that you would tell your parents or a group of parents to convince them that it is equally important to have both these online and the co-curricular the extracurricular Uh, miss shireen and the panelists please proceed to wind up after this question Sure. Okay. So maybe along with this question, uh, we can just have each one of the panelists then share. So what would be your biggest, uh, like, like suggestion to the parents out there? Maybe you can give us one each on telling them how to draw this balance for their children. A tip. My, yeah. my top tip would be have fun. So whatever it is, whether it's an online lesson, whether it's face to face, whether you're at home with mom, whether you're they're at preschool, children, when we're talking about preschool age children, they learn by having fun. And that goes back to whether they're in education or they're not education. So my top tip would be to try and always have fun with your children because they will learn. And that will then, again, from my kind of health and brain perspective, it will stay in their brain and they will build a new neural pathway. So have fun is my top tip. And if you don't have fun, you're going to switch your children off to academia. Um, they won't want to go to university because from the age of two it will have been drummed into them to learn to learn to be educated and if they enjoy doing what they're doing it's lifelong learning brilliant reminds me of maria montessori and what she Mm -hmm. said what you need to do is instill the love of learning in a child offline online anyway like abby said focus on the learning and instill a love very well said yep shilpa and abby yeah, if uh, it's uh, since we're talking of co-curricular, we all agree that it is already imbibed into the preschool curriculum. It's not a separate uh, thing that we look at as for as the extracurricular. We would, but uh, since we're talking of online specifically from parents' perspective, I would really ask the parents to explore the various edtech platforms that are available. Don't just go by word of mouth. You know your child the best. You know the interest level. You know your child. So look, explore all the uh, ed tech platforms that are available and then come to a decision just by word of mouth that this so-and-so ed tech platform worked with my child doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work with every other child. So that is also very important. Be picky. As a parent, I need the parent to be picky when they're looking at this online um, platforms. The best way is to look at an online platform that is having a combination of co-curricular and academia. That's the best way to look at this aspect. That's what my uh, input would be. Brilliant. Thank you. And Abby, what about you? I I think, uh, yeah, I agree with everyone here. I think uh, one of the biggest things that parents could do is to try as hard as possible to remember that it's not just about academics and learning through, you know, through online. 
but to put a focus on your child's personal, social and emotional development first, because if you do that, actually, the other things will come after anyway. So if you put a focus on that, and if you're not sure how to, then talk how to do any of these things that we've mentioned, actually, talk to your child's teachers and educators because they can guide you and help you. Right. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'd just like to end with a short summary for parents. Glue it. And the G-L-U-E is G is go have fun with your kids. And the L is make sure children love to learn. And U is what Abby said, understand that social emotional learning is going to be the foundation for everything else. And E is uh, what Shilpa said, explore different platforms. So um, I guess parents go glue it and try it. And I'm sure you'll have a great experience. Thank you to all the panelists. Well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Shireen. Thank you, Ms. Shilpa, Ms. Mandy, and Julie and Abigail. Thank you so much for giving our audience valuable key points and takeaways uh, for this session. I'm sure parents would love to explore more about different platforms, but now it's our time to move on further. Thank you so much, all of y'all, and stay tuned. We're moving on to our finale session for this evening. And since we've all been talking so much about brain, brain research, mirroring, neurons, so we have a neural expert on our panel today. We have Ms. Manjula V. She is an expert in neuropsychology. She is the founder and the co-founder of uh, IBBRF. And she's going to be talking on a very unique topic on orchids and dandelions. Over to you, Ms. Manjula. Manjula, please unmute yourself. Thank you so much, and uh, I really love the way you introduced me in this forum. And I first thing I would like to apologize. Yesterday was my session due to some family emergency. I could uh, I couldn't participate, and I'm glad that Amrut helped me in rescheduling, and I'm here. So the first point, Im important point, when the question comes, what do you mean by orchids and dandelions? And why do we bracket or put the students in two different baskets like orchids and dandelions? The first question which comes into, a, uh, into my mind is like, why are some children more resilient, right? And they can cope up with any kind of stress and adversities in their lives and susceptibility to both bad and good environments in which he or she finds herself or himself. So here we need to, as a parent, as a teachers, we need to think about how do we support them? How do we nurture the orchid children, those who can thrive uh, more in their lives? So here from the neuroscience perspective, there are two important things where we need to understand uh, to guide these orchid children. So always in our neural concept schools or in your neural education, we tell our teachers to teach for an orchid because dandelions don't care where they are, what kind of stress they can undergo, right? So here, orchid children, basically, they like try to think, like uh, they like to have the dinners every day, in the same place at the same time with the same people, having the same kind of rituals that family goes through for weeks to weeks, month to months, and years to years. They love these kinds of routine and sameness of life from day to day, weeks to weeks, and so on, right? But whereas in dandelions, you put them in any tough weather condition, it might be in the it might be a physical weather condition or a different kind of epigenetics either in their classrooms or with a tough environment they don't bother even the teacher if they're calling the child in the classroom they're taking up the child's name in the classroom the or dandelion child doesn't bother so here as a teacher as a parent we have to have the complete responsibility to greenhouse these orchids so now question comes how do we greenhouse these orchids? So we have two steps. One is like, basically when we talk about the stress, stress stir, like there are two things which happens in our brain, right? The one, one system is what we call it as the system of uh, releasing cortisol. And second one is the system, a uh, response system called autonomic nervous system. 
right? So here, the cortisol, uh, cortisol is the first very important uh, primary response system, which, which is centered between our hypothalamus of the brain. And this system releases the stress hormones that is called cortisol, which has a profound effect on both immune system as well as the cardiovascular system, which is functioning within us. Second one is autonomic nervous system or we can call it as a fight or flight response. This is one of the most responsible uh, for like a sweaty palms, sweaty palms or a little bit of tremulous or dilation of pupils and all of these which are associated with the fight and flight response. And when we monitoring these responsivity, both of these systems that the children went through in mild challenging tasks. So when we talk about the task, like there may be like a, there is an unknown person, who, like for example, in your kindergarten, in your early schoolers, what happens if a new teacher gets into the classroom, what happens? Obviously, the children will start screaming, crying, crying. They'll be like, what is happening? Who is this new person? Is it a threat for me? There will be 101 questions will be running in the children's brain. Right. So here for that reason, uh, like uh, in that case, teacher, it might be a new teacher, uh, though uh, a new teacher, she should be in a position to understand the child and she should be well trained to greenhouse that orchid children. And it happens in my uh, in homes as well. Uh, very importantly, I'm uh, blessed with the twin sons. They are studying in grade eight. And they're two different, they're non-identical. One looks exactly like me and other one looks like his father. But uh, their behavior, their, pattern, uh, their patterns or whatever, their, uh, their behavioral patterns, it's entirely different. I really suspect, are these two my children? Or did I get mixed up in the hospital? Like one likes pizzas and other likes the very traditional mama made food. Other like music, the one more like mathematics. Other likes writing, other like uh, uh, rubrics or origami. Two different entities, same family, same parents, same epigenetics. And one is definitely an orchid and other is in Tantali. If I don't pay attention to my one son, like, I don't give it like, Prajwal, do you want this? Do you? If I don't cuddle him, like, he'll be like wondering why, why my mama is not touching me. First, he feels like I need to touch him. I need to hug him. I need to speak to him. But other one, he doesn't care. Like, he just lies on, he watches his uh, videos or he's uh, just gluing to his laptops and so on. So here in such conditions, parents should be well informed how to handle these kinds of children. Right, so always orchids and dandelions, always care for an orchid because orchids are very sensitive, they have very susceptibility in the environment. So we need to understand about the genetics and epigenetics because end of the day, any kids in the classroom, they all have 100 billion neurons. They all have 100 billion neurons and uh, trillions and trillions of synaptic connections. So it's like infinite potential what, what the children have. So never as a parent or teachers, let's not do bring in rewards and punishments, no stratification and not let's not get into the routine expertise, but give them often good challenges and bring lots of novelties and three important mantras that is diet, exercise and sleep laced up with novelty and challenge. So this is what is all about orchids and dandelions. I hope today I have just squeezed in my experiences within the short span of time. Thank you, Ms. Manjula. I'm sure some valuable takeaways by you. Definitely epigenetics plays a very important role. And you've seen it in your own house with, two, with uh, your twin <laughs> children. So I'm quite amazed and I'm sure we'll have another session with you where you could explain us uh, educators and parents more about epigenetics. So in epigenetics and from genetics, like one more important word I missed, serotonin transporter gene. It's a very important gene where it makes you understand about why am I short, 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 uh, short, short, long, short and short, long. 
So there are each like uh, differences what we can see in the child. And very importantly, I would also like to share this book, this Orchids and Dandelions written by Thomas Boyce. So here he has brought up the beautiful research and his own life experiences where Thomas himself he feels that he's in uh, dandelion and his sister just, uh, get it a little closer to the camera we, we can see the book yes uh, one and minute one minute let me just remove this virtual we have lots of tick okay yes Is this fine? Now it's visible. yes orchids and dandelions dr Boyce, where he writes his own experience he's a pediatrician basically and uh, he shares he's a dandelion whereas his sister mary is an orchid she undergoes lots of traumas right from his younger age, and she really struggles a lot. But what he tells, if we nurture the orchid, they, can, they have the power to thrive in their life. It is not just living, but they have the ability to thrive. So let's all greenhouse these beautiful orchids. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our uh, speakers and panelists. We've had wonderful uh, two days in detail of session. Let's wind up today's day. We've had our keynote speaker, Mr. Karthik, telling us some wonderful takeaways on social development and their ability along with academic development. He did mention very clearly that please show your children what to do rather than what not to do or rather than just telling them what to do. Ms. Deepa Bhushan very eloquently mentioned that it's so important for parents to show children some love because that's all that they ask for. Ms. Prithi, I think we all will agree we love the unique way of explaining us different parenting styles and you've given, given us any animal that we're going to see now, we're going to see a parenting style in them for sure. <laughs> Ms. Sana and Ms. Kathy, we had a wonderful time with your fun games and I'm sure all of we all lost track of time with those games and riddles. They were really fun. Thank you, some parents who came up and participated. We had a wonderful session with uh, Ms. Smriti again. Ms. Niyati for her wonderful story, Kapitara, an amazing story, so expressive. And I'm sure most parents would like to go back and see her story. So go back to Facebook on ECDF's uh, Facebook page and go back and see the story again. And a wonderful panel discussion with so many valuable takeaways. It's so important to engage our children. Uh, Ms. Sharin had chaired that session with Ms. Shilpa talking about uh, how, to, how we should be exploring uh, different options and see what best works for your child and not just you know, copy somebody else's child and say, oh, that works for that parent and the child. This would work for me too. And I truly loved when Ms. Julia and Ms. Mandy mentioned about the story massage. I think that was a very unique concept and I'm sure most parents would like to try them with their babies and toddlers. And we definitely spoke about the gap in the zero years. We, we spoke about uh, parents not considering uh, this year, the pandemic year, and just counting it as a zero year or skipping it. And with Abigail giving us so many valuable inputs to on co-curricular activities and what, what, how India is so similar to Hong Kong. Yes, it truly is in terms of when it comes to academics. And lastly, Ms. Manjula giving us a wonderful takeaway on epigenetics and orchids and dandelions. So we've had a very fruitful session and we can and 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 last session. but not yes. the least amrit thank you so much for hosting and uh, that's you did a lovely job and i thank all the speakers who joined us today and everybody's been watching us uh, the live the recording for the two days would be up in our youtube channel so you will be sharing the link very shortly and uh, yes it was i think two lovely days of lot with a lot of takeaways so thank you so much and amrit thanks for taking out your time Thank you so much. Lastly, stay tuned on ECDF's channel. We are there on YouTube, Facebook. So please look forward for our forthcoming webinars and more summits for all, all of you. Whether you're a parent or an educator, we promise to keep you engaged further. So please have a very happy and safe weekend ahead. We wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.